SWAC, SWAC members, our services staff, and guests. Mark, can you lead off with introductions, please? Sure. Uh, Mark Jockers, Chief of Staff, Clean Water Services. Jody Newcomb, from the Yep. Oh, hey there. I'm Chris Devotney, Clean Water Services. Amy, Stephanie Moore, Clean Water Services. I'm Josh Vernier, IT, Clean Water Services. Oh, hi, I'm Sherilyn. I'm um, city manager in Tualatin, and I was just trying to check out what the QR code is. Like, what secret? Are you jumping ahead? I, I'm not sitting here. I'm like, I don't know. She's on top of it. Always has been. It's nice to see everybody. I'm George Marsh, um, Ag representative. Andy Hawkins, District 4 Rep. I want Jess here. Karen Huggins, Clean Water Services, Community Good evening. I'm Bob Bonger, here with Regulatory Affairs Group at Clean Water Services. Kathy Peter, I am with Finance, Clean Water Services. Jack Bell, Chief Business Operations Officer, Clean Water Services. Daniel Ritter. <laughs> Daniel Ritter, Clean Water Services, Communication. Dave Connor, Education and Outreach Services. Education and Outreach Services. Lane Stewart, Environmental Lab. George, uh, I'm Terry Song, business rep and current chair. One item that I wanted to note tonight that Stephanie and Jody have asked me to do is since we record these, this is how we capture our meeting summaries in a lot of ways. It's helpful that when we do ask a question, if you could state your name, talk on it. I should have said, this is Mark Jockers. <laughs> I have something I need to, I'm not modeling it very well, but just, or maybe you say at the end, but I just want to make sure that we can do that. This is particularly for the staff in the back of the response. With that, I will let Terry Song go next. <laughs> Online introductions or did I miss that? All oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Stephanie will recognize our virtual attendees. Well, uh, I would like to start with our CWAC members though, who are online and should have control of their microphones. So we'll go around and begin perhaps with Alex. Good evening, everyone. Alex Fan, District 1 Neighborhood Rep. And Matt? Uh, Matt Wellner, Builder, Developer Rep 2, and I apologize for not being there tonight. I had something else that kept me at home. We also have um, Diane. Good evening, everyone. Diane Taniguchi Dennis, Clean Water Services. And with Clean Water Services staff, we have Jerry. Hi, Jerry Linder, General Counsel, Clean Water Services. Nice to see you all. Joe? Uh, yes, good evening, everyone. I'm Joe Gall. I'm Chief Utility Relations Officer for Clean Water Services. Nice to see everybody tonight. And Jan. McDonald Clean Water Services, and I am at a conference now, so this is the end of my video uh, because the Wi-Fi here is just not sufficiently robust that I feel like I can be on video the whole time. Chair, so we have two members of the public with us tonight, so I will uh, ask Dale B to please greet the commission. Dale, are you able to hear us? Can you hear me? We can now. All right, Dale Feek of West County Citizen Action Network. Thank you, Mr. Feek. And we have Glenn Fee with us. Mr. Fee? Room keepers. Can we have you say that just one more time? Your audio didn't come through well. Oh, sure. I'm Glenn Fee. I'm with Tualatin River Keepers. Thank you so much, Mr. Fee. Chair Song, I believe we have recognized everyone. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Hey, everyone should have received the meeting <coughs> summary from last meeting in your packet. Anyone have any corrections to that? I love this problem. This is the first time I'm seeing meetings where Focuses on the questions and the responses, not what matters, you know, who asked me, like what time and what 
love this problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. There you go. Okay. Okay. The commission reviewed okay. the summary of the January 11, 2023 meeting. With that, we'll start our program. Our first item is the Natural Hazards Mitigation Plan Update and Schedule. We have Ann McDonald, Ms. Navani, to present to us. Again, thank you so much for letting me speak with you tonight. It's such a pleasure to be here. My name is Chris Novotny. I'm the strategic risk manager for the district. Part of my job at the district is to help us facilitate our emergency response. The topic of this evening is the natural hazard mitigation plan. You know, every single day you turn on the news and there's another horrible catastrophe that's a result of a natural hazard. And if we take a look at the 7.5 magnitude earthquake that hit Syria and Turkey. The death toll right now, I heard, is around 12,000 and it's expected to climb. You turn on the TV and you see mudslides and drought and floods and tornadoes. It's all around us and seems to be rapidly amplifying. You'll be happy to know that Clean Water Services has been working on a plan to identify the natural hazards the district will be exposed to, as well as creating some mitigation plans and strategies to help us reduce the impact of those losses. We're excited to share this plan with you tonight. It's a compilation of a tremendous amount of very hard work on behalf of Ann McDonald, who is our, we get Ann's title correct here, and is our senior water research program manager. And as she said, she's attending a conference tonight, so we'll be all remote. And Shannon Huggins here tonight with us also. Shannon is a public involvement lead for this project. I'll turn this over to Shannon in just a minute and she'll help run you through this exercise that you have the QR code for. But again, I'd like to thank you for giving us this time and energy. We look forward to your we should be receiving a link to the plan in the course of the next week. We'll ask that you review this at the same time we put it up for public review on the Washington County Emergency Coalition site. So again, we welcome the feedback. Shannon, come on up. Thank you, everybody. So hopefully you've all seen the QR code. Maybe many of you have already tried to see what it's all about. This is this is supposed to be a fun exercise. Um, so if you, if you are familiar with QR codes, you just take your smartphone, you point to this with your uh, uh, photograph app on your phone, and then cover it over, and you should be able to open up on Chrome or some browser. Uh, you'll come to a short poll or quiz. Um, the uh, person who set up this quiz um, may have uh, not allowed some of the questions. You'll want to answer more than one thing, and you may not be able to. We're learning. You all are awesome. sort of my guinea pigs. Thank you for that. So we're going to give five, six minutes. I think that's about as much as you need. If you haven't taken the quiz yet, but this is just to kind of get your juices flowing, get you thinking about this topic, um, I imagine we've all probably been thinking about some of these things recently. Uh, and then from there, I'll, I'm going to hand it over to, we're, we're going to take a look at the results, just to kind of see what most people are thinking about. And I'm going to hand it back over to Ann. Folks online, they have the QR code as well. The QR code, uh, excuse me, the link actually is in the chat for this meeting. So if you are joining us virtually, please write the chat link. You'll notice, I think it's questions three and four are very similar. One is about what you have done and one is about what you would do. It's not really the only difference. You can only pick one. Well, unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately, could pick on Yes. No, I don't think should be follow the box. Oh, you know, pick one. But now you can pick three. It gets better. 
hate to frustrate everyone, but. So this is, uh, we're looking now at question number two. So we're just gonna kind of slowly go through since we can see the live results. We'll just slowly go through and see what people are responding to. Not surprisingly, uh, many people are thinking about earthquake structural retrofit projects for the services to think about. This one talks about what actions you've taken to prepare or mitigate for natural hazards affecting your home or business. More than 60% of you have survival kits. Good for you. Not going to go. <clears throat> Water and then this is the one, what would you do or what are you willing to do to prepare natural hazard? This is the last one. Last one. What are the most important actions for clean water services to take to reduce the impacts of natural hazards? And this one, I believe, did allow you to select three. And the big one is implement earthquake structural earthquake projects. That's a interest to many. I think that covers it. We have 18 people who have responded, so it's covered with all of CWAC. Thank you for being my guinea pigs. Because first of what will be many pools. You see the first question. I never can I see the answer sure. to your first question. I'm kind of curious about um, our experience as people that have lived here about what sort of natural what are the different natural people have experienced? Because this is a driver for how we plan for these things, right? Is it both kind of a, a, a this is what Chris, where's Chris? There she is. <laughs> the butt taught me about frequency and severity, frequency of return, severity of impact, right? So it's a question one. That's Everyone. interesting. So everyone's experienced extreme heat. That's the most common. I don't know about you all, but I was like winter storms, ice storm, like cold, like all those things felt similar, but these were actually taken from Siemens survey, so they define those differently. Many of us have experienced an earthquake. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I 
pretty fast when you have some memories. Well, just in the interest of staying on schedule, I um, thank you all for taking our, our poll. And I'm going to turn it over to Anne. She's going to share and kind of give us an overview of the National Hazard Mitigation Plan. Tara had a quick question. Uh, thanks. Um, so I answered the um, what uh, natural hazards have you ex experienced? Um, not thinking about here locally. Um, I guess when you put this out for public consumption, is that the intent that you want to know what we've experienced locally or what I've expect expected in other parts of the world or experienced in other parts of the world? So, so this this was just kind of a for fun poll. Okay. Define fun differently. <laughs> taken from the longer uh, FEMA survey that was offered uh, maybe three months ago, something like that. I don't know how many people took it. We live in Washington County, but it was it was uh, offered about three months ago. Okay. okay. And, and that, that, my understanding on it is it's self-defined. It's really have you experienced these things? Um, like I grew up in Montana, I never experienced a tsunami there, for instance. So I would yeah, not yeah. answered that question. So I think they're trying to get a pretty broad picture, but um, we we are. I think what these plans are trying to do is look at what happens locally, ultimately. Well, and I'm sure there's other data other than uh, other than polls like this that we can find out how many of these events there have been here locally. So I get I get the fun part of it too. Okay. So, um, uh, thank you very much. As uh, um, Stephanie, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and advance the slide, if you would, please. Um, so, as uh, Chris mentioned, we are um, at the uh, toward the tail end of a process that's been going on for. Um, almost the last year working on a natural hazard mitigation plan. And we've been doing this as part of a cooperative effort uh, to update the 2017 plan um, that had been done by Washington County, Hillsborough, and, and Tigard. Um, the cooperative effort includes uh, Washington County as really the, the lead entity and um, all, almost all of the incorporated cities within Washington County. Uh, Tualatin hitched their wagon to Clackamas County uh, in a previous cycle, and so they're, they're on, uh, on that path. Um, and then uh, we, there are a couple of other special districts besides Clean Water Services, so uh, Tualatin Hills Park and Recreation District, and Tualatin Valley Water District are also um, part of this multi-jurisdiction plan. Um, it's not just multi-jurisdiction, it's also uh, looking at a number of different hazards. And uh, then we went through and along with every other jurisdiction individually and developed um, clean water spe services specific uh, as well as partnered mitigation action items. And we've integrated this uh, as we're developing it with other clean water services efforts like the Scoggin Safety of Dam project, uh, our climate adaptation roadmap, seismic retrofit efforts uh, for the water resources recovery facilities, wildfire risk assessment that we did with the Joint Water Commission in, um, in their source area, and then our integrated planning, sub basin planning, and general um, capital improvement plan uh, uh, process, development processes. So, Stephanie, if you could do the next slide, please. So, I said that this was an update from the 2017 uh, plan. So, um, at that time, we kind of came in as a, a friend of the family with Washington County. And we're participating, but not a full participant. Um, so when we, that plan was submitted to FEMA, um, FEMA approved it, but then said, okay, next time 
we'd like you to do the following. So they wanted a stronger public engagement process than had been, been done for that earlier plan. They wanted uh, the plan to consider diversity, equity, and inclusion issues uh, to the extent that that, that followed local policies and, and, um, and state guidance. We added a couple of, of hazards to the, the laundry list of hazards that were being evaluated and then were supposed to consider climate change as part of the plan. So you'll see how all of those um, uh, fit in as we go through the rest of this presentation. Next slide, please. This is the list of, of hazards. So it's not quite the same list as the one that you just looked at. Um, as you can see, dam failure was an explicit uh, hazard listed. Uh, drought, earth, uh, extreme heat, floods, wildland fly, fire, windstorm, winter storms, those all have uh, a nexus into climate change. So, um, uh, as we are developing the the um, an understanding of the the exposure of clean water services facilities and uh, and or our operations to these individual hazards, um, uh, we're taking it on a hazard by hazard basis, and then um, looking at uh, mitigation actions that we might undertake that are um, above those that that we are currently working on. Next slide, please. So Shannon briefly, okay, go ahead and click Stephanie. Um, Shannon briefly mentioned that um, uh, there had been a survey that had gone out uh, last fall um, to Washington County residents asking them several of the questions that you just uh, uh, responded to as well as as several others and I just wanted to go through a couple of highlights of that survey so one of the questions that was asked was what hazards have you experienced and Matt to, to um, get to your point this was asked broadly not just in Washington County um, so it was sort of asked in two parts what have you experienced overall in your life what have you experienced in in Washington County um, click again Stephanie please so this was the response from uh, that survey. And as you can see, it, it mirrored very much what, um, what you all said. Things that were top of mind, like winter storms, extreme heats, uh, uh, ice storm, and then a good number of people uh, apparently have lived uh, on the leading edge of the North American tectonic plate and have in fact experienced earthquakes. Um, even if not necessarily here in, in Washington County. Um, click again, Stephanie, please. The, another question that I thought was, was interesting and worth mentioning today, what are the most important facilities for local governments to, per, to protect? And Stephanie, if you could click, please. Um, and again, here you can see not, not dissimilar from, from what you said, uh, utilities um, came in as, as one of the key uh, uh, facilities recall that this is across all of the jurisdictions across all of Washington County. So communications, first response and and uh, medical facilities were um, also listed as high. Stephanie, next slide or click again. And then the last one that I wanted to to bring to your attention as a as a result was who do you trust for information? So Stephanie, if you could click again. And in this case, uh, orange is, is good. That's a high trust and um, uh, government agencies and utility companies come in right after university or research organizations and the Red Cross. So um, we're in a position at Clean Water Services to be uh, an instrument for information and, uh, and a trusted um, organization in, in that uh, in that space. Next slide, please, Shannon. So, um, a little bit about the, the report itself. It's organized um, into sort of two different parts. One is what's referred to as the base report. And this report is common to all of the, the jurisdictions that are participating. 
Uh, it includes uh, uh, a few appendices, but it contains a, a community profile, like who is Washington County? Uh, the hazards that we have specific to Washington County and an overall risk assessment for those hazards, the mitigation goals that uh, that were developed, and they were developed by <coughs> representatives from all of the participating jurisdictions that we refer to as a steering committee, um, and then uh, a description of how the plan was developed and and what is anticipated for implementation. Adding to that are a series of, of what in FEMA land is referred to as an annex, um, and those are uh, jurisdiction specific descriptions of the, the facilities, the communities um, that the jurisdiction is, uh, is stewarding um, and the vulnerabilities of those facilities, those communities, the jurisdiction's operations. Uh, mitigation strategy, so each jurisdiction's own take on, on their approach to mitigation, and then a series of proposed mitigation action items. So again, you'll hear, hear um, us discuss both the base report, and then we'll be talking about a clean water services specific annex. Um, and we are one then of a series of, of annexes. Stephanie, next slide, please. The mitigation goals, as I said, were developed by the, the um, participating group as a whole. Uh, and they are laid out here. The first is to um, minimize loss of life, public and private uh, uh, property damage while protecting and restoring the environment. So um, that was a key part of of that particular mitigation goal. The next one was to ensure effective implementation of mitigation strategies and increase the success for uh, obtaining external funding to implement those strategies. Next goal was to develop and implement natural hazard education and outreach programs to increase awareness, engagement, and partnership around natural hazard uh, mitigation and, and understanding. And uh, to then to support the adoption and application of hazard informed development processes and standards. To enhance communication, collaboration and coordination amongst the agencies and the private sector. And finally, to enhance the ability of the economies of Washington County and its jurisdictions to rebound quickly. Um, these are, uh, as I said, group mitigation goals. Clean water services obviously spends less time in the hazard informed policies and standards uh, uh, and regulation end of it than some of the other jurisdictions. But um, all of us are paying attention to uh, to these goals and they are consistent goals with the Oregon Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan and with statewide planning uh, goal seven. Next slide, please. The mitigation actions themselves um, represent commitments by clean water services um, over the next five years, which is the life of these plans. They're updated every five years. The action items are intended to address recognized vulnerabilities and, um, and are new New starts, if you will, to um, to clean water services activities. Uh, the action items are are in many ways the core of the plan, and so um, they're a focus of the public engagement requirement uh, requirements that FEMA has for these plans. Um, it's a minimum of of two opportunities. So we already spoke about one of those opportunities for public engagement, which was the survey that was um, put out last, uh, last fall and each of the jurisdictions sent out notices of the survey, um, which was hosted on the, the Emergency Management Cooperative of Washington County's website. Uh, 
Uh, so that was one uh, engagement opportunity. This meeting and your review of the the CWS annex and and um, parts of the plan are an opportunity. And then uh, finally, there'll be a, a broader public review of the draft plan. And FEMA requires that the engagement actions be documented. So one of the base plan appendices includes this documentation, so screenshots of, of our uh, social media posts. Next slide, please. The action items, as I said, are the, the crux of the plan. We developed items that are useful for clean water services that tie to our mission and activities and are recognized and recognize our integrated planning approaches. Um, and then they were documented. We developed those as uh, part with a, an internal technical team um, that spent a fair bit of time uh, brainstorming and thinking about what we're already doing and, and what we might want to build on um, based on our understanding of the, the hazards that um, clean water services facilities and operations would, would likely face. Uh, we do have to have two action items per hazard. So with that long list of hazards, you can see that we're, we're looking for action items that tick off several boxes at one time. Um, uh, as we went through these. So the, as I said, the action items uh, are in response to um, uh, our vulnerabilities. Um, there are things that we're intending to do or that we um, uh, see a need to uh, develop to properly respond to uh, natural hazards, things for which we would seek external funding, um, having them documented in the plan uh, aids in making the case to external funders, particularly to FEMA. And things where we are logical conveners. So this is where we would, we may not lead an action item, but we would undertake some one uh, in partnership with uh, other collaborators in or outside of the natural hazard mitigation plan process. We did not include things that are sort of strictly in the business process. Uh, end of things, uh, end of, of our activities. Um, and there were several other action items that we initially came up with and then felt that they would be better suited for inclusion in the climate adaptation roadmap. But um, uh, this document and that roadmap are, are um, uh, well linked. We also had to prioritize each action item and uh, use the, the same method was used for prioritization from, for all of the jurisdictions. It's one that's developed by the State Office of Emergency Management. And, and essentially, a high priority means this is something we're going to do within the first couple of years of plan adoption. Medium is within the, the lifetime of this particular update. And um, a lower priority is one that either we would start later uh, after this plan or um, one that would be a, a long-term uh, thing that would where the the um, completion would extend into the next plan iteration next slide and so uh, that's a summary of the the plan itself i'm going to turn it over to mark to talk about the public review process and and uh, timeline Thank you, Anne. Um, and I really want to speak to this as it relates uh, to the, the, the commission here, but also have you be aware of the broader uh, public engagement process that's happening right now, beginning in early February, which we're in right now, through early March, the base plan, which is the county's piece, as well as a number of the city and county annexes sections are being reviewed. Um, what will happen after this meeting is next week, we will provide you a draft of, of the plan that we have, the annex, as it's called, associated with clean water services, facilities and operations. You will enjoy all 91 pages of that, I'm certain. Um, but we, want, we would like the commission to look at it, to review it, 
And then we're going to ask for your input comments or questions in advance of our next commission meeting, which is on the 8th of March. And then we'll bring that back. And based on that, any questions you have or any suggestions you have, we will consider how we might want to update that draft plan. And then subsequently in early April, we'll be taking it to our board of directors to go to walk them through that as well. And then ultimately after that, it will be it'll be submitted to FEMA. So do I have that process correct? And is that you do. you do. And so once FEMA uh, approves of the plan, it will come back to uh, our board for yes. formal approval as a uh, an RNO. And then uh, once our uh, board of directors has issued that approval, um, then the plan is adopted. And the nice thing, uh, Stephanie, if we could have the next slide, please. Um, the nice thing is, is that once FEMA approves it, Clean Water Services is able to receive FEMA grants, and we have one grant application right now uh, pending uh, for our watershed navigator position. That is um, one that the watershed council we would act as grant administrator and and um, do it also with the soil and water conservation district. Uh, after FEMA approves it, the plan, as I said, is is not one that that we want sitting on a shelf. We want it being used. Um, we will be getting together uh, periodically to, um, uh, as a steering committee, to provide status reports on um, uh, on where we are on the action items, and uh, we'll be tracking that in the origami system that that Chris Novotny um, uses for uh, her other risk management activities. And then uh, the plan will need to be updated in uh, 2023. And so, you know, in four plus years, we'll start the process again. This time it should be a little bit easier because we'll be updating a plan rather than starting from scratch. So that's, um, that is all I had to present this evening. Um, and I very much thank you for your time and then uh, if I could have one last slide, please. Um, you heard Mark uh, describe kind of what our intent is going in the next week or so to get your input, but we're very much looking forward to um, to your reaction to what we've prepared. So thank you. Thank you, Anne. Uh, any questions in the room? Yeah, this is Ronnie. Uh, we just take my location. So, questions only about today's presentation, not questions for this plan. Uh, actually, I have four questions here about what's the amount of the second one. So, one of the things that I was um, listening to your presentation is I understand this is something that's, that goes into a grind. For FEMA. Is that right? Um, not exactly. So uh, the plan is a, a federal requirement of, oh, and I'm going to get this a little bit off, I, the Federal Disaster Act of 2000. Um, okay. FEMA does consider having this plan, having an approved plan, as a prerequisite for getting some of their grant money, not, not disaster response money, not all of their um, post disaster uh, mitigation um, funds, but many of their most of their pre disaster money um, having this plan is a, uh, a is a prerequisite for obtaining those funds. Okay, let me ask the same question in a different way. Is this something that goes as a team puts to a budget or is your plan dependent on a budget given to you? Right now, there um, aren't, uh, other than those things that are already in our capital improvement uh, plan, um, most of the activities under the plan are, uh, are strategies that would be developed by individual staff members at, at Clean Water Services. So, um, uh, so those strategies could lead to subsequent activities that would be reflected in the budget or reflected in our, in our CIP. But um, right now, 
uh, other than uh, the seismic upgrade that is in the CIP for our field operations center, we don't have capital projects in this as mitigation actions in this plan. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think and it was some more time to get in. This helps, this helps. Any questions, I would like to get someone else and tell them before I can go ahead. Okay, I'm going to be speaking for the lady. This question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the other question was on, you know, where you talk about the mitigation goals. Uh, is there some kind of a review or look back on the goals that were set in the last plan and how we did against them? So, Ann, do you hear us? Do you? You might have lost Anna. So, Ann, can you hear us? Yes, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay, um, so the the uh, mitigation goals generally generally follow the last plan that we were, you know, kind of sitting at the table for, but not called out as a as a entity. Um, they do more closely follow the mitigation goals that are in the the current Oregon State Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan. And I'm sorry, I don't have the 2017 goals memorized. Okay, no, that, it's, I don't need the exact review of those goals. I'm just asking if there is some way to say, hey, these are the goals that we set in 2017, now we're in 2022. What would you do about those goals? Did we achieve them or did something fall aside because there was no budget or because we tried to climb the sky and it was Whatever. There must be some way to look back and say, these were the goals we set. This is where we are against those goals today. So, because we were not a, a um, an official individual entity, um, uh, we didn't track. So, so that type of tracking was done for the individual um, action items, not the mitigation goals per se. There is a discussion about how the new goals um, sort of fit with the 2017 goals in the base plan. Uh, and then uh, Hillsborough, Tigard, and Washington County, because they did were formal participants in the 2017 plan, they do have a status update on their um, mitigation action items in the base in their annexes. That's a great answer because. Usually, goals and actions go together. So, even if you're reviewing or tracking the actions, that's a good enough track. Yeah. So, okay. our, our statewide planning um, goal seven also informed the the mitigation goals, and so, um, and that's been constant over the last, you know, twenty some years. So, we're still consistent with goal seven. Okay. Good. Okay. But that my question that I the goals and actions. One of them has to depend on the other. If I can do a follow on, this is Elaine to uh, Ramish's question. Um, even though, you know, the 2017 plan wasn't so much a clean water service product, um, at least within the CWS annex that's in the natural hazard mitigation plan. If you aren't already planning to include that feedback loop on the next time around, um, can we put a placeholder here in the conversation to say that when it comes to the 2028 update that you will have revisited those action items and goals and strategies and Kind of. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> I, I I understand what you're saying, and yes, that that is an explicit excuse me, <laughs> an explicit requirement for FEMA. So um, that becomes a section for the 2028 plan under the the FEMA guidelines. Thank you. 
Uh, so we also, um, uh, the, the group went out and, and got a FEMA grant to, to um, uh, support hiring a consultant to help us with the plan. And, um, uh, and as a condition of that grant, we have to report back to FEMA periodically on action item progress. So there isn't a legal obligation to under to do these action items, but as we were developing them, we did uh, we were very conscious of the implied expectation that these would be activities that we would uh, uh, undertake seriously. Any questions from our vir virtual participants? Any questions in the room? Hearing. It's Elaine again. I have a, a question on a different part of the plan. The um, public involvement and the DEI linkage. Um, an online survey from FEMA and a citizen advisory committee are very kind of traditional um, ways of reaching out and um, I was just hoping, I, not to put you on the spot if you're not ready to talk to it, but I'd be very interested to know how Clean Water may be engaging with people who are going to be impacted, but may not be engaged now. Do you have anything to add there? Do you want me to? Yeah, well, we are... Uh, we we are doing our outreach um, than you know, than what we traditionally have uh, done. We we do more outreach to um, a lot of our CBLs and relationships that we have. So we're we're doing some more, um, but I think we would like to have more engagement. As we are uh, hoping that all of you will help us do that too as we go back out to your. This thing will share what you're learning and kind of give us feedback that way too. And I say, I know the survey in the fall, which was really FEMA driven and vanished in a lot of ways by Washington County. I think they did a pretty good job trying to reach out to different communities. At the end of the day, though, it's still a survey. It's still an online survey, which has its own limitations as well. Our interest that we really had as we looked at this as, as a, a leadership team at Clean Water Services is we want to have the conversation in particular with the policymakers, with our advisory commission, and with our board to make sure that we're very clear on that. And then also to look at how we can resources. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Well, thank you, Anne. Oh, Thanks, please. Thanks. Diane's got a question. I really um, appreciate that question, Elaine, because really the countywide emergency uh, planning for the natural hazards mitigation plan should be addressing the broad community issues and how they're going to um, engage the broader um, community in natural hazards planning. The Annex for Clean Water Services is really focused on the impact of these natural hazards on the business continuity of clean water services to continue to deliver its uh, wastewater services in the event of a natural hazard. So ours is the way you can think about it is if you were a business or an organization, it would be how does that hazard impact your workforce? How does that hazard impact your ability to uh, provide in our case, wastewater and stormwater services, right? So that's sort of the subtlety of the purpose of this annex for clean water services. Is that helpful? It's Elaine again. Yeah, that is helpful. Um, and I don't wanna overstay my welcome on this particular subject, but I will also throw out that there are overlaps and opportunities to kind of leverage some of the work that Clean Water Services does. I'm really familiar with 
riparian plantings and shade credits and such. And that definitely can dovetail with um, some of the heat island effects and the um, heat impacts, heat wave impacts to people who may be in less vegetated areas. So I just, I'm, I'm going to be trying to look through that. And I, I look forward to reviewing the draft annex. And, and what I will say is that that is, the, that angle is one of the things that we elected to put um, uh, and focus in our climate adaptation roadmap more so than, than this particular plan. Um, but it is very much uh, something that is on the mind of staff. Okay. Thank you. We have another question. I was just curious how many in this room have taken the Washington County survey. This is the first time I've heard the survey. Could staff raise their hands? I think that might be the other first time. I've <laughs> so. uh, Thank you, Nisha. Yeah, that was, um, we posted it across all of our social media, it's on our webpage, but my bad. Um, duly noted. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that this is a topic that is difficult to get the general public's interest in. Speaking for myself, um, I, I just, Think of myself as the average Joe. Um, I I would be happy to know that my utility district had a plan, but I would not personally probably go and review a few ninety page document. Um, and I, you know, I may not have the insight that it has, or that some of the others in the room have. Um, but I would uh, I would you know. So the, it's hard sometimes to engage folks. I, I think one of the things we're trying to do too this time around is a little more storytelling. So, um, you know, we've got a blog now and we've got um, our newsletter. We're trying to get folks more engaged, but it is kind of, it's really top of mind these days with something in the world. And it's, it's just one of those topics that doesn't grasp everyone. I'd like to share the two. Two methods that work very good for us. One of them was explore. Yes. And the other one was change the What was it? What was it? Association. Oh, yes, the next, the new methods. Yeah. For us, the uh, next door was a very effective way to think out because. People who follow next door are the ones who are looking for this Yeah, and we did. We did post it on. So we posted on next door, so did the county and many of the jurisdictions. And so Ann mentioned in the back of uh, each jurisdiction's uh, plan, there is a, you know, this actually show screenshots of all the different ways that you were outreach and did. Yeah, yeah. It'll be interesting to see. We don't yet know. Um, or actually, I think we do. We did get the results from that survey, right, Ann? And I think there were maybe 250 out of over 600,000. Yeah, we we did get the results. And they're actually in one of the appendices to the, the base, uh, uh, base plan for, and so it, it shows what all of the individual jurisdictions did to get the survey information out. And then we'll do something similar in terms of getting a uh, documenting review of the the base plan and uh, individual annexes. To try and incentivize the incentivize some uh the results in our classes. Right. Yeah, well, I appreciate the, uh, the suggestions and the, uh, the interest. Um, people keep coming, share other 
your ideas as you become a product of the experts. This is Andy, and I have one comment. I could even like give it to the county and put this to you. Other than that, I don't know if you guys have done that. Uh, well, so the um, so the county also did a ton of outreach. So they did actually. It was in um, it should have been in your as well down the bar in the electronic center. Yeah, yeah, it was a. It was a jurisdictional, wide uh, effort to try to get the word out. <clears throat> There's also other like nature or outdoor groups. Uh, I think one of them's called like Cradle Broads for Nature or something. Um, but I can give you the link. Um, you know, they I think would be interested in stuff like this. Just not of this topic, but anything, guys. I'll, I'll, email, I'll email you their website. You know, when we go to send you the link to our annex, hopefully sometime next week, um, we would welcome your ideas for propagating it. Or we can, you know, should you have an opportunity to help us get, get it out farther and wider. One more extensibility. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, hey, uh, moving on to our next topic, which is the watershed permit update. Jane? There's an online question. Oh, okay. Easy. Alex. Yeah, I don't want to, sorry to dwell on the topic too much longer. I just, you know, had the comment or maybe suggestions too, since um, there, you know, the additional requests from FEMA to have a DEI component, uh, knowing that, you know, I guess countywide we have a, a lower response rate. I think it will even be more challenging, especially how how you reach those um, communities. And so, you know, I would offer some suggestions about that. And so I can follow up after about maybe some ways to also re reach those communities. That's it. Thank you. The survey did go out in Spanish, but I believe that's um, and was out at like farmers market and libraries and things like that. Um, uh, but I'm sure that there's uh, sort of more structure that could be put around that type of outreach. Right. And there's a lot of other communities as well. So, but yep, thanks. Thanks, Alex. Well, you're not Jamie. No, sadly. Uh... Uh, sadly, I'm Bob Baumgartner. I'm Bob Baumgartner. Uh, sadly, <clears throat> Thomas make a difference at Mark. <laughs> Natalie Jamie is ill, so she asked me to uh, fill in for her uh, making this presentation. Jamie is an expert on the NPDS permit and the status, so I will try to do the best I can to, to follow up. and. What we wanted to do, want to be able to do, is give you a quick summary of the uh, MPDS permit status. Uh, many of you who I recognize, we've talked to before about our. There we go. Our uh, MPDS permit. Uh, some of you are new to me, so I will touch a little bit on the background of what our permit is and what it does. Uh, and at least one of you is a ghost from my past, which is kind of funny. Uh, but it's nice to see you again, Elaine. And with that, uh, what I did want to cover was generally what the NPDS permit is, uh, what it does, how that implements the Federal Clean Water Act requirements, uh, our status of what it, where we are with it now, and then some of our vision for the future as we go forward. With that, I did want to touch a little bit on what the role of the CWAC is in the uh, developing the permit. One thing that we do substantially different than just about everybody else with a national pollution pollutant discharge elimination system permit is we set out ourselves goal for what we want to achieve with that permit. Most entities just simply wait till the regulating agency comes along and then tells them what they have to do. Then they either figure out how to do it or kvetch about it or a little bit of both. 
we try to get ahead of the game and understand what we believe is best, not only for the Tualatin River and the Tualatin watershed, but how we can best implement that and achieve our goals to both provide improved water quality, ecological enhancement, uh, try to be innovative and do so uh, at reasonable costs. Because of that, we are always thinking of what we want to do and how we do that differently. It's that kind of question and those kind of questions that we bring to CWAC. So you guys provide that sounding board for us from our innovation, what makes sense, where we want to invest and put our time. One of the huge advantages of that, uh, and I speak with some of the experience I had when I was with the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, is they are very much swayed when we were able to tell them we had a public review board provide input on what we wanted to achieve. That makes it a lot easier for us to be able to demonstrate that we have objectives that go beyond just saving money for the utility, but that we really are trying to achieve some of those broader objectives. That becomes very important as DEQ makes their decisions on how much discretion and flexibility they're going to provide in developing our permit. And you'll see last time we talked to you guys was it 11 times about our upcoming permit, and that's because we had a number of issues that we were dealing with. The input that we got really did help us focus on a couple of areas, and I'll just touch on a few of them. One of them was the investing in our natural treatment system. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been up to the Forest Grove, our natural treatment system. If you haven't, I encourage you to go look at it. It does a great job of blending some very, <coughs> excuse me, impressive water quality improvement, uh, but ecological and ha habitat improvement. People who like birds just love it out there. Uh, and it's a fun place to go to. Uh, but that was really a heavy lift for us to be able to get that to the place where we could be able to permit it and operate it. But uh, we believe we've done so and your input was critical in doing that and helping us do that. The other area, and Elaine, you touched a little bit on this just a minute ago, is our trading program, it's expanding our trading program, uh, but also looking at how to do that more innovatively. And we are doing work now to expand our horizons and really be looking at some of the cold water anchor areas and how we can incorporate that, incorporate that into our, our trading program, which will become more important as we think about the potential impacts of climate change. Probably the third area that was really helpful was looking at how we manage ourselves from nutrient control, investing in our current infrastructure, but doing so in a way that allows us to uh, expand our treatment capabilities, but make full use of the existing infrastructure that we do have. Next one, please. You're so good. Uh, we have one huge advantage as we think about our permit, and that's that our geopolitical boundary is very similar to our watershed. Because of that, we have our four wastewater treatment plants and our stormwater program all nestled into the same basin and all within the same kind of geopolitical boundaries uh, and regulatory oversight. And that's given us a lot of opportunity to look at how we manage a permit differently than most other uh, entities. Uh, the other thing that's a big driver for our permitting program is uh, we're a big source into a small river. Years and years ago, we came to grips with that we would have to manage both the flow in the river as well as our treatment levels in order to protect the beneficial uses of the river. Back when we used to have a lot of algae in the river, uh, low dissolved oxygen as we upgraded our plants, we really did try to strike a balance of how we manage flow. In the river, we manage flow through two reservoirs up at Barney Reservoir and Scoggins Reservoir where we own water. We release that very strategically in the summer and in the fall to help offset natural water quality issues in the late fall, but also to help us manage the level of treatment that we need to provide. And we use it to mitigate, or not mitigate, but for our trading system for temperature. During the uh, peak of the summer, well over a third, sometimes as much as two thirds of the water in the Tualatin River 
come from either our releases or our discharges. Mark likes to show pictures and point out that at times in the past, the river up above uh, our plant at Rock Creek up at Rude Road would dry up if it wasn't for our releases. Uh, that's no longer the case, but it is true up about here where the water is withdrawn from the drinking water plant without our releases. The segment of the river during the summer would indeed dry up without our releases. And so just to cover in general what an MPDS permit does is uh, it really regulates the federal clean water. I like to walk around when I talk, but Stephanie told me he had to stand on, she even made a spot for me to stand. <laughs> I'm going to struggle doing that. The uh, Clean Water Act was developed to eliminate pollution. And that's really what its goal is. Beyond that, its goal is to make sure that we are protecting uh, the beneficial uses, fishable, flammable uh, for water within the United States and at all navigable waters. It is a very much a heavily regulated field that we are in, and the Clean Water Act, it regulates that. But we haven't achieved the goals of no pollutions, but the Clean Water Act does require if you are going to discharge, uh, you need to get a permit. And that permit regulates what you can do, how much you can do to discharge, and it requires a lot of monitoring, although everybody trusts us, they want to make sure that uh, we uh, fulfill that trust. And in doing so, uh, there are two kinds of limits that are established. Uh, one of those limits is everybody who has a wastewater treatment plant has a certain level of treatment that they have to provide. And the second type of limit is limits that are based on what you need to do to protect the uh, river itself, protect water quality in the river. All of ours are based on the second part. We've gone way past that first basic technology level. And all of our limits are based on a lot of calculating and modeling that we do to show that we can and will protect our water quality in the river. Uh, and our permits also give us some flexibility in how we operate depending on the flow that we release that I just talked about. So it becomes very complex. Because of that, we have a lot of reporting that we do and a lot of monitoring that we do to demonstrate we are meeting the limits that we have for our discharge. Uh, we don't have any compliance schedule because we don't get out of compliance, uh, but we do have a lot of industries that we regulate. And just as a real uh, sidebar, I guess, is the requirements for developing these limits for industries were developed in the mid 70s. Uh, at that time, we didn't really have a high tech industry. And now we have very huge high tech industrial discharges coming to us. But the act requires we keep up on our own to make sure that the chemicals being used at the high tech industries do not damage or cause problems with our wastewater treatment plant, human health, fish, or aquatic life. And so there are always new pollutants coming up that we have to create plans and efforts to control. Probably heard of the PFOAs and the PFOSs recently. We're spending a lot of time trying to figure out how we can work with our industries to limit their discharge coming to us. And we re regulate them. We regulate the water that goes out. What we do to clean up that water is we grow bacteria. We take that bacteria, make a biosolid out of it. It's great for the farmers because it provides a great organ, organic source. Uh, we love it in the stone organ where you can usually really use that. Uh, and that's heavily regulated as well to make sure that what we put out on the land uh, doesn't cause a problem. Uh, and we are also expanding our recycled water. When I think of the recycled water, much of the water we provide is, we say, near the drinking water, but most of ours is well beyond drinking water quality. Uh, and we want to be able to expand the use of how we can use that as a commodity, whether it's for agriculture or whether it's for environmental improvements, wetland creation, but we're trying to expand that program. Uh, and it is heavily regulated. One of the huge advantages is if I mess up, my job is uh, making sure we're in compliance, Diane can go to jail. <laughs> so uh, usually there are fines or penalties if we do get out of compliance rather than a jail schedule. Next one, please. And so with our watershed permit, 
we have integrated our four wastewater treatment plants uh, into the one permit. We've also linked that with our stormwater programs, uh, the construction and erosion permitting program that the state has, and the industrial stormwater program that the state has. We've integrated that all into our permit, and we act as agents for some of those state permits. One of the really huge advantages of that, especially if we think about these three plants at Rock Creek at Hillsborough and Forest Grove, is not only are the permits connected, but they are physically connected by pipes. That has allowed us to shift water between these plants, still under the same limits. We have bubble limits, and that allows us to optimize the treatment at the plants, but we also don't have to build redundancy at all of our plants. Uh, because of that, we can provide that redundancy. We can provide a high level of treatment. We can choose which plant we are going to. So we optimize the treatment depending on the uh, condition. In the winter, we do one thing. In the summer, we do it a little bit differently. We we'll use our plants to do that, uh, which saves us lots of money, but also gives us a lot of opportunity to provide high levels of treatment. Uh, the other really neat thing that we do in our watershed permit is the trading program that Elaine talked about. And I think Jamie talked about it last week where we are offsetting uh, temperature uh, by planting trees or releasing water. We are starting to integrate that into our stormwater program. So when we think about how we manage stormwater, it gives us a lot of opportunity to improve some of our urban tributaries. Uh, by doing a restoration or enhancement of those tributaries and use that as a credit for how we manage stormwater in the basin. Uh, and we are also providing water into some of the uh, deep water tributaries uh, to enhance cold water use or cold water beneficial uses of those tributaries. Uh, we were the first uh, watershed permit in the nation. If you look at EPA guidance, you'll see Clean Water Services list because this is how you should do an innovative permit. Uh, there have been a couple other uh, watershed permits developed since ours, uh, but they only have parts of what we do. None of them have quite the full scope of what we've done in our watershed permit. So going through just how the regulations work, Federal Clean Water Act with its amendments provides the overall regulatory scope of what we have to implement. We haven't seen a huge stack of documents uh, through the code of federal regulations that implement the Clean Water Act, uh, and then all for the Oregon administrative rules. It's a process called cooperative federalism, and that means that the state uh, implements much of the federal regulations. The state can develop their own regulations, put them to beyond uh, or more aggressive than the federal regulations. The state does that. It's enforceable through the federal regulation becomes by uh, preference part of the Clean Water Act. State of Oregon has a very strong environmental ethic and its regulations often go beyond the federal regulations. Uh, and those get reflected then into our MBDS permit to show that we are meeting that permit. We do lots of monitoring. Uh, we are on task of this year to do uh, about 250,000 individual analyses uh, as part of our permit. About 25,000 of those are explicit permit compliance metrics that we have to show any one of those would put us out of compliance, um, but we never fail those, or very, very seldom fail those. Jamie, who talked to you last, um, last month, uh, does a lot of reporting for us. Uh, we routinely do about 80 reports to EPA and or DEQ a year, depending on the number of conditions that come up and with our routine reports. Sorry about that. Next one, fine. <laughs> so what the, it actually requires specifically for our permit, I've talked about some of this. Uh, we have lots of limits. We uniquely have limits based on the amount of flow we have in the river because we manage flow. Uh, we have monitoring and reporting. Uh, we have a program that does a lot of work with our industries and with the industrial oversight. Uh, and we are expanding our recycled water and our biosolids programs uh, with the biosolids, especially to make sure that we understand what it's the application of the biosolids on the land 
make sure what we put there stays there so that as we see future regulations coming, we can demonstrate that we are effective with it. We do stormwater management and in stormwater management, this is something that we do very closely related with the member cities. It's really very much a collaborative kind of an integrated approach and I expect we're going to be even doing more of that uh, cooperation with our member cities to develop the plans that we need to bring us into the future into the stormwater program. EPA notes that the only area in the United States where pollution is increasing is stormwater. So we fully expect them to be giving us a lot more advice and input on how to manage stormwater going into the future. Uh, and then it has specific enforcement penalties if we fail to implement those. Usually the enforcement is uh, based on fines uh, and orders for compliance. If we fail to do that, it can ultimately result in criminal procedures. And we occasionally get involved in implementing uh, criminal actions uh, with EPA and or DBQ. Next one, please. So as far as our Permit, uh, we were very successful with our permit uh, this year or over the last year we developed our implementation. It took a long time to work with DEQ to make sure that we met their requirements, met the state policies, as well as achieve those objectives that we had talked about and could craft permit conditions that allowed us to do that. So we are continuing our watershed approach. That was critical important to us. We are continuing to improve water quality. Our treatment is getting better. And we are looking at some alternative strategies for treatment. For example, we are looking now at relying almost exclusively on biological methods to remove the nutrients from our plant or our water resource recovery facilities and really start to limit the amount of chemical addition we do for that so that we are putting less chemicals in the river, which can have some impact uh, and toxic effects of their own, but also it's a much smaller carbon footprint. We're not having somebody mine that up, that alum up from British Columbia, truck it down or put it on a train and bring it down. So we're looking pretty broadly at our environmental and carbon footprint. Uh, that's part of the cost effective investment. Not only do we think we'll get a better ecological outcome, we're gonna have less cost in doing so. Uh, and a much smaller environmental footprint. Uh, that means we've got to do a lot more of a monitoring to demonstrate that we are going to be able to comply with that uh, and analyses to be able to demonstrate we have a fail safe if it does, does fail. Uh, and we're looking for an integrated plan. One of the things we talked to our Oregon Department of Environmental Quality about is Permit, although it requires us to update it every five years, if we read around for five years and then start to think about what we need to do, we're going to be way behind. We won't be able to accomplish our objectives. So we're starting to set up these discussions, envisioning our future now. How do we get there? How do we get the regulating agency of DEQ the information they need so that they can make their decisions in a timely manner that allows us to make that timely decision? And we'll continue to provide a high level of uh, effluent quality, please. Uh, and again, I touched on many of these, uh, but our permit is innovative. This pre thinking, pre planning has allowed us to be very innovative. Uh, credit trading, I think, has generated a lot of environmental improvement uh, and at a cost, less cost for our wastewater treatment plant. We have flow based and seasonal limits. It means our operators got to be very effective at paying attention to time, conditions, stormwater, and managing our plants. Uh, but they do a very good job of that, and that gives us a lot of opportunity to optimize our treatment. Uh, I do think as we expand our integration of the restoration program into our stormwater, we'll see some huge advantages of that, especially in some of our urban streams and developing streams. Uh, that will be more cost effective and generate greater outcome. Uh, the flow management uh, I talked about, but the Farnham natural treatment system. Uh, again, I'm going to recommend if you haven't been out there, go out there. That really should be for many municipalities, the future for wastewater treatment and wastewater policy. 
very beautiful area, it does a tremendous job at removing metals, other toxics, nutrients, ammonia, and some of the nitrates, some of the pollutants we see coming uh, into regulation in the near future. Uh, and we are working very closely with the research team so that we can develop the kind of information I talked about so that when we go to the regulating agencies, we have a good argument for what we need to do and we can demonstrate that it will work. Next slide, please. We do have a lot of challenges. No matter how you look at it, we are a big discharge into a small stream uh, and our environmental conditions are gonna get more difficult. We're gonna have growth in the basin, uh, both industrial growth, more people coming here, uh, more industries and people means we've got more to work with uh, and we're gonna have to figure out how we work with that. Uh, we have aging infrastructure. Much of our pipes went into the ground 30, 40 years ago. We're gonna to have to make sure that we know how to manage all of that infrastructure and as we build infrastructure that we can keep it maintained and up to date. Uh, climate change, we are just beginning to try to understand what impact climate change is going to have on us. And remember I talked earlier about our limits being based somewhat on the flow in the river. Flows are gonna change, seasons are going to change, how we manage that water is going to change. Uh, and the cop, uh, Elaine, I think made a great point about the uh, heat dome and local hot areas. The same thing goes to how do you try to make sure you understand where what the biolog biologists call the anchor areas that you need to protect that expand those cold water refuges are all gonna start to come up as issues we should be thinking about in our trading programs, whether it's the uh, trading for the uh, temperature or integrating into our stormwater program. Uh, we heard about risk and vulnerability. We're gonna have to incorporate that into our future plan. So how do we make sure what we have is stable and we'll work within that risk? All of that means we've gotta be planning for some economic uncertainty. Uh, economics is hard for me to plan for. I'm not rich yet. If I was better at planning, I'd be rich. Uh, but we've got to think about what that means for our ability to fund all the work that we need to do in the future. Uh, really, the uh, cost of treatment keeps going up. Cost of building structures keep going up at a rate that is much faster uh, than the rate uh, that people are getting paid is going up. And that's going to cause stress on our system. Uh, and we need uh, not only clean water services, but within our whole business to be able to figure some of that out. I think that's going to be a stressor in the next 10 or 20 years. With that, we also have a lot of opportunities. We're innovative and we'll continue to be innovative. Uh, and as we think about the integrated planning, uh, I think that's going to be a great tool for us. And with that vein, we have already started figuring out what we need to do for our next permit. We have a pretty good idea of at least some of what we need to accomplish. We'll be thinking through much of what we continue to need to do, working with the regulating agencies to put us on a long-term path so that as these permits come up every five years, it's not a shock. Keep on the a long-term strategy that we hope will work. And with that, the process, permit every five years, We've gone through, we send an application in six months before the permit is due. Permit lasts for five years. We do an internal review of it. A lot of the public notice, um, the internal QA, I probably could have thought of a better term than that. That's, you guys, that's where we're bouncing ideas off of you. Uh, go through a public notice, we review the comments. It's another role you have. When we're going through our comments and responding to how DEQ is drafting the permit, we're looking for input from you guys on those comments and what we should be doing about them. Um, then it goes to issuance. Once DEQ issues it, uh, the time for discussion is over. Uh, that's time then to figure out how we implement it. And with that, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I do have a question. Sorry. 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 Sorry.
these uh, digital requirements coming from DEQ? Where are they coming? Yeah, we are getting uh, increasing regulatory requirements, both from the Environmental Protection Agency and the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. A good example of that would be uh, a new water quality standard for aluminum. As we had had to regulate aluminum as a toxic, EPA has developed a water quality standard for aluminum. We now have to meet that. That influences how we operate. Another example is going to be the PFOA and PFOS. Uh, those are going to be developed as a series of regulations, both that influence our biosolids uh, and our in-stream discharge. Uh, DEQ is also looking at and will soon be publishing new criteria for how they apply their dissolved oxygen standard in urban streams. That's what we've got to be worried about storm on if you want something to be scared about tonight. Um, so uh, that's going to have us really thinking again, this relationship between the stream enhancement and the water quality in urban streams. And so those are just three examples of what's coming off the cusp now. There are plenty of others that the state uh, is thinking of. Uh, and that EPA is also thinking of. Um, we are preparing for viruses as a water quality criteria instead of the bacteria. Uh, in doing so, we will be planning for what does that mean for our disinfection programs. That was a long way of saying they're coming both from EPA and CEQ. Just curious because I know there is a natural tendency to Post regulation and said, Oh, I'm not a bottle of water. I was just trying to see what's the source where that is. I mean, we are not putting in the dish down water. But I, um, this is Mark. Our, I think it was our former general manager, it might have been Bob, who said, in, in our business, and I think in a lot of things that, that we all work in, the, the goalposts are never getting closer. They always seem to be getting further away. And part of it is we, you, you, when we're talking about this dinner, you look at what the Tuolumne River looked like 53 years ago, right? Open sewer, basically, and not a lot of flow in it. Um, we've accomplished a ton of things. Like the industrial, a lot of the industrial issues have disappeared because of industrial protrude, but there are new things. It's the PFO, PFOS, it's what, uh, there's description, things called micro constituents, you know, pharmaceuticals, all those sorts of things that we chase down um, and trying to figure out where those are. And that's just stuff that Bob and his crew is trying to stay ahead of. And, and thanks, Mark. And just to follow up on what Mark said, those are good reminders. You know, you're right. There's this kind of natural, and they say, oh my gosh, another regulation. And then, uh, you know, when I got into this business, we were frogging, we could measure something at a milligram per liter. Now we're measuring it, you know, Picograms per liter, you know, uh, and so the regulations follow that. But one thing that we do really well, especially with a research group, is try to anticipate, get ahead of those so that we are planning for those so they're less of a shock when they come up, and even to some extent really influencing what those regulations are. We've been very effective at that, both on the state and federal level. Uh-oh. I guess it thanks, Douglas. Matt, you have a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, Bob, do you anticipate that there we're going to see any near-term changes to our design and construction standards as, as stemming from the conditions in this permit? I think we may see some minor changes to the design and construction standards uh, around how do we capture the language that says to prioritize uh, on-site Retention. Uh, I don't think that means we have to retain everything on site, but how do we, what kind of demonstration do we need to work with the developers to identify that we at least thought about on site detention as our first priority? And then the other thing I think we may see is a little bit of the opening up of how do we make the uh, stream integration work in the urban environment? or the stream enhancement with the uh, stormwater enhancement. So all in all, I think it's much more positive than we had thought as we were going into this permit discussion with DEQ. And was DEQ receptive to kind of the regional projects approach, kind of looking at basins 
and identifying opportunities for more regional facilities rather than local facilities? Uh, great point. And thank you, Matt. And yes, indeed, they were very positive about that. Good. Good. Thank you. I just had a question about how the mechanics work on the putting side with in industries. So do the industries they have a permit from CWS? How often are their permits updated with new requirements? Um, the industries do get a permit from us. They're updated. Normally, every five years, although recently we, we made that a little bit more uh, frequently than every five years, just to catch up with some of the changes in the rule. But normally, it's every five years uh, to update what they need to do and what plans uh, they also have to confirm. That. And did that answer your question? I think I missed it. <laughs> yeah, I think so. So, conceivably, they would have to answer their permits with install new equipment to take out aluminum and PFAS? We, we are working with the industries for both aluminum and PFAS. I don't think we're going to have to make the uh, industries remove too much of aluminum. Most of that was the salt we put in. There are some industries that use aluminum, alum, uh, part of the food processing. So we'll be talking to them about best management practices. With the PFOS, we are looking to industries to at least start off with uh, product substitution, looking for what they can use in their processes rather than a PFOS containing material to be able to reduce that. One of our industries has elected to install treatment uh, where they pull that off from an ion exchange, evaporate it, turn it into a salt, and run it to a, that salt to a landfill. And we have started talking with another industry about a treatment process, but mostly it's going to be best management practices and product substitution to keep the PFOS out of the water stream. So, add something there too, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. You know, a lot of those limits that we put on industries, right, are going to be driven by some of these national pieces or, D, you know, uh, PFOS, PFO, there isn't that limit yet, but we know it's coming. So when we talked to this commission in 2019 on kind of strategies, we started putting in place to how we monitor that. Other pieces that we do, we work with industry on first of temperature as a, because temperature is a pollutant. Right? And it's funny, you, you, we talk to our counterparts on the East Coast and they're like, temperature is a pollutant? I mean, they just cannot understand it because it's because of this uh, salmon bearing strains that they won't tell us. So, even when we're working with industry, we will be looking at how they can help contribute to manage temperature at their site, rather than us trying to manage it to treat a plant or plant more trees. So some of it's driven by what actually the local things are impacting the tree itself. No, that's great. That's great. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is Elaine. Um, Bob, I'm curious about the stormwater management um, piece. But I have a funny feeling that part of your answer is going to be some of that's being dealt with in the climate adaptation roadmap. It feels like a lot of these things are very, there, there's a lot of overlap here. So um, maybe I should just ask, can I find the climate adaptation roadmap on the website? Boy, this is you're so good at this. So this is exactly there. We are bringing that particular proposal to our board on, in April. Yeah, in a in a uh, what we call a board learning session. We spend a day with them. One of the things we are going to recommend to them is that they charge this commission with the review of that roadmap and more importantly the metrics associated with what we should be using to monitor progress on it. So I'm I'm uh, that's that's what we're working toward right now that it will be brought back here. Okay. Or actually, it's my start here. All right, but I won't have it in hand before I'm looking at Clean Water Services Annex for the risk mitigation. Okay, more to come. I have homework to do. Yeah, <laughs> related. So um, for 
guess non industries, so just residential, um, how is the what people put into down the drain and like sets on their lots? How is that um, taken into consideration of once it gets to services? I guess because you can't. I, I don't think that there's a permit that I apply for as a resident. No. <laughs> so I, I wanted to create a permit like that, but Mark will have me. No, the, uh, the, uh, but, you know, that, that's a huge, huge question. We do have a uh, ordinance that gives us authority to regulate things if we need to, but most of that is done by talking to Ellie. Through education, yeah. um, communication campaign, which is probably the best I can't like talking to you because you know, it's pretty robust to educate them. Although, surveys tell us that most people do not realize that what goes on to our brand is pretty So, is there a requirement for that anywhere to do that education? It's in the permit. Yes. Oh, okay. There we go. Well, we do it because it's a good idea. And also that it is in our permit. We do outreach to uh, commercial sources uh, and uh, just general outreach to areas of we or the people to try to keep that stuff out of uh, water, give people uh, options of where to take it to. So I think it's important that you can correct me if I'm wrong, rather than just tell them not to do it, but tell them what they can do with some of this waste. Yeah, there's a lot of social research that says people respond much better to if by chance we happen to locate an area that is uniquely high, then we have a unique outreach effort. Is that right? Correct. Yes. It's like you know what you're talking about. <laughs> so I, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you two examples. One is we have we, we used to have a lot of we still do have some problems with lights, washable lights. Some such thing. Um, it would fog up pump stations in Tualatin, it's, it's her citizens. No, <laughs> but we could very easily see where they were coming from. So we went directly and did education door to door uses on stuff. Often it was service people in the homes that were using things to flush them the drive. They didn't know, them. she didn't know. Um, the other thing is we are looking at a campaign right now related to the cold water issue is um, you, Use cold water. Or wash with cold water. Never, never turn your washing machine to hot water. Use cold water. Take a cold shower every night. No, no, no. I don't think that. Happens. We're going to ban water heated. No. So, but really trying to get some of that climate ready community stuff going because that helps us too. I mean, even if we get people washed their clothes with cold water. Questions. Can I do a quick follow up to Nisha's question here? Because you mentioned things like pesticides. Do you monitor or test for some of the common insecticides, herbicides, and things at the treatment plants? Um, we're doing some in stormwater this year. We have done some in the treatment plants in the past. We don't very often. We have a wide range of uh, Organics that we test for, but some of the uh, old pesticides we haven't tested for for many years, in part because our treatment plants are very effective at removing them, uh, breaking them down, and are putting them into the bio solids. Strong water side. Yeah. Just well, yeah, yeah, and that's what I'm thinking is, I mean, just it's long been a pet peeve of mine that you don't have a big sign at the Home Depot with a shelf so of all the different lawns. Weed killers that says read the label yeah. because that's where the regulation yeah. is. Yeah, I actually so, emailed we want to say I'm part of an HOA and I keep trying to get out of the pesticides applied to my lawn. I don't want a lawn on my property, but I have to have one. So at least don't dump pesticides on my house, but I can't do that yet. And so I contact Clean Water Services, like, can you back me up? And there's nothing that I can say, like, Clean Water Services says, don't do this, even though my house is right next to a wetland. Um, so that would be interesting to have. Yes, that's 
cost killing uh, formulas that go on your uh, see. So we're dealing with that right now in some HOAs. Uh, there's Clean River Coalition. Uh, they, if you go to that website, there are some great educational short videos you can share with your HOA and care far and wide to help educate people. Well, what USWSDD has backyard habitat program. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. Anything else? Walking outside your box. I guess you can see. It's not. Yeah, I keep wandering down. Stephanie was yelling at me just a minute ago. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Next up, we have the Butter Duck Project update from Ellie. We have some great outreach coming up. Yeah, um, what, a, what a good segue from earthquakes and permitting to um, what we think is a really fun, um, successful, innovative, collaborative uh, project to talk to you all about a little bit. So thanks for letting me crash. Um, I'm Ellie O'Connor. I, I work here at Clinic Services and I coordinate and deliver a lot of student and adult education. So, ranging from the regulatory stormwater pollution prevention work um, to environmental education to working on this really interesting how to get people to change their behavior and not use so much hot water and send it to us. Um, so, I will be talking about this, this bottom up project. Um, and here's what we're going to go over a little bit of grounding in the project itself, um, kind of why we invested so much in getting engagement here because we, we don't have the resources to do that everywhere. So why was this project an example of that, a place where we have this opportunity? Um, and I'm going to spend a lot of the time uh, that I have, which I know is not too much, um, to talk about our student education work because that's my purview. That, that's what I, I have done here for a very long time. And so hopefully, hopefully some hope. Some hope. And we have a short video to show you before I get into it. Um, so, in case you're not familiar, the butternut area is right here between Hillsboro and Beaverton. It's unincorporated Washington County, so a Loa area. Um, the area in which we work is um, we work with the school there, and that is a Hillsboro School District school. Um, but you know, very very closely the other direction, it could have been Beaverton. So it's kind of like this this nexus area. Um, so as Bob was mentioning, this yeah, thank you, Bob. Um, we didn't even plan that. Um, the, the incorporation of stream enhancement and stormwater work, this is a, this is a really great example of that. Um, so this project had that picture that is there. That's a water quality facility, which is one of two that are on the Butternut Creek Elementary campus. Um, so that's treating stormwater and holding stormwater from the adjacent neighborhood, um, goes into those stormwater quality facilities. And then Butternut Creek is, is just on the school boundary. Um, the project also included a lot of enhancement on the stream itself. And then when we get into some of that community engagement, you mentioned the backyard habitat certification and working with the 12 and SWCD, that kind of furthered the project area from just that stream corridor into the neighborhood. Um, and then we did this really, what I think is like bringing it back and centering it back at the school. So some, some work with that, the school, which is like geographically kind of right in the center. So it's kind of like the heartbeat of this project. Um, so the community markers project is what how we dug the, the elementary work um, and really getting that education to the community through the school community. So um, working with the students, uh, working with their families, but also using that school site um, as a place for the community at large. We know that folks are walking through that area, whether they have students there or not. Um, and so it's really a nice central place. And this project kind of had all the pieces, all the things, and, 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 and. Um, and so that's where we're excited to share a bit about it. Um, so here, here's a map of the of the space. Um, and so this the Butternut Creek is a tributary to the Tualatin, so it runs right into the Tualatin. Um, and this area here is where the Tualatin SWCD was working um, with the HOAs to do enhancement um, in that particular area. And then Clean Water Services. Um, worked in reach one there and reach two, a lot of similar work. So our enhancement work includes removing invasives, replanting with natives here. It included large woody debris, green and green spring. So a lot of things focused on um, improving water quality and also habitat. <laughs> um, and then in that reach two, that's where the school is. So um, Butternut Creek Elementary is right there. 
Um, so that included those stormwater components uh, that we mentioned, and then also the work with the elementary school. Um, so again, why why did we invest so much in this area in terms of engagement? Um, there are some places where we we need buy-in from the community and from partners to do additional work. So we're not we're not done in this area. We knew that we wanted to go in and, and do this work initially, um, but doing engagement with the community really is allowing us to have um, a good base and then build off of that and have buy-in from the community to do more work in the future. So. It wasn't a limited duration. We're going we're to be there for a while. Um, this is a community that Bob also mentioned the aging infrastructure, right? <laughs> Thanks, Bob. You just teed me up for all these things. Um, so, aging infrastructure, um, pre regulation where um, homes could be closer to the water than we would build them today. Um, so, issues with stormwater, issues with flooding uh, that is very present in this community. So that's an opportunity for us as well. Uh, some of the feedback we got from the folks there was, you know, clean water services has had an on again, off again presence. So we see that as an opportunity for us to have a robust presence. And that's another reason we decided to invest in this area. Um, lots of neighbors and it's, we say interested, um, also vocal. Um, so, so that's a, that's a thing. Um, and then also having um, an equity lens. So we worked with um, Samara Group to do focused work with uh, communities of color in this neighborhood. Uh, we really wanted to make sure we were hearing from folks that don't traditionally attend meetings, uh, maybe don't always take a survey. And so we really focused work on that. Um, all of the materials for the open houses um, for the communication were bilingual English and Spanish. We chose that because the school demographics are 40% Latinx. Um, and so we knew that was the second language used in that community. Um, the open house was held at the elementary school. Um, we had local vendors that had food, um, and really the visioning was done in this way that's depicted here on screen, which is um, asking the community about the creek. We weren't asking about the project. We were asking about values. We were asking about what they hoped to see as the outcomes, um, and also in this very visual, simplified word way, so it's accessible to people. Um, and that's what we did with our education as well. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, the idea here was what we heard from the community through through those open houses and other um, stakeholder interviews were, you know, this, you know, you should really work at the school, and that's music to my ears. Like, okay, let's yes, yeah, okay, let's do that. Um, we've worked at Butternut historically in a limited capacity, gone to do presentations there, paid for buses to do field trips. Um, this this was a different this was a different opportunity, which we were very very excited about, um, and so we wanted to have some way to have folks experience the space, but not in a traditional, um, here's an interpretive panel, right? Everybody's been to a park, you see an interpretive panel and it says, look for this bird, uh, listen for this beaver, um, here's about this project, or here's why stormwater is important because we're playing water services and we want you to make all these changes. Um, and we took a different approach here. Um, we worked with the community, a group of folks that, um, that we paid for their time to come and participate in, in, um, in some sessions. And what we came up with was we were going to get student sourced material for the interpretation. And so it ended up not being an interpretive panel, um, but rather these like art installations. And so we wanted them to blend in with the environment and act more like a, a learning prompt, right? So we're asking a question as opposed to telling them something. So you're learning through experience and how you see things versus what we think you want to hear. Um, and so we we ran it kind of the way that I describe it is like if who here has participated in like a coloring contest or like you've submitted something for a calendar. Same theory, same foundation, but but different. Um, because in that instance, sometimes all you get is the sheet. You're like, here's the sheet. Could you please give me something? Um, so what we did was we went to Butternut Creek and we worked with every single class one at a time. Um, and we took them out and we just we just did a site walk. Um, we aligned some of that content with the science standards because we really needed teachers to see what we were doing as valuable to what they were already doing in the classroom. We're there to supplement that work. Um, but a lot of those teachers had never been down to the creek, even though it is a three minute walk. Um, and so we helped, we helped them have that experience and we used learning prompts. Um, and so we took students out there, we let them experience the space. 
Um, and then we asked them to tell us what they thought and not tell us with words, but we gave them a template, we gave them a pen, and we said, Ross, what, what, what inspired you? What do you wonder? What did you see? Um, and then through that process, we got 300 students that voted out. We got 200 submissions. Um, and so I'll show you a little bit about uh, in a second, uh, kind of how that manifested. Um, but the working group that we had been working with through the whole project, they helped select the art pieces that were installed on, onto these poles, which I'll show you in a second. And then um, in early October, we had this lovely community celebration where it was a bit of like unveiling of these poles. Um, and we had, it was after school, so the school community could be there. Um, and it was, it was lovely. People got to walk around and see it. So this was, uh, this was my co-educator set in the field on a very rainy day, but we had fun anyway. Um, and so these are our learning prompts. And again, it's, you know, we're not telling you things, we're just asking you what you see, what you hear. Um, and we did everything bilingually. So that was, that is um, what, the, what the school needed. Um, and also, you know, very simply too. So what do you see? What do you wonder? We're not telling you about, you know, a beaver and its effect on the environment. We'll get there. Um, this is just the prompt of that. And so when we, uh, the day that we opened the, the student pieces, I say it was kind of like a birthday present. Um, we had them organized by grade. And so we had these 200 submissions to go through and we were just so excited. Um, these are some of our personal favorites. Uh, I call that one Splits Frog. Um, we also have this Wes Anderson inspired raccoon. Um, but we got everything. We got flora, we got fauna, we got mammals, we got amphibians. Some of them, which we saw when we were down there, some of which we definitely didn't like this, this e eagle raptor definitely didn't see that. Um, but horse tail, absolutely, right? So it was so amazing to see what they, some of them were very literal and some of them were very imaginative, which was great. We got too, too much, we, got, we couldn't use it all. Um, and speaking of not being able to use it all, at the community celebration, we printed every single piece that we got on banners and hung them on the fence. And it was great because every student could go through one of my line and show it to their parents, whether it made it to a poll or not. Um, so these are the these are the poles in the field. Um, so we love when we call this like sticks and stones, although these are supposed to be beaver chews. Um, and so each one has four to six um, etchings. So we took that student artwork and it was etched into the wood. Um, and also there are some um, one line sentences. A lot of them were sourced from students. They had to describe what they wrote. And a lot of them wrote things like, all my friends are here, or there's life at Butternut Creek, which I was like, we're totally didn't ask for that, but we're using it. Um, and so printed in English and in Spanish. And then we also have these stones that are placed in the landscape as well. And this was to get across some of the messages that Clean Water Services felt like we needed to tell as well. Um, but again, they're in the environment. They don't stand out. They blend in. And the idea there is you walk by once, maybe you see some things. You walk by again, maybe you see something else. Um, so just blending into the surrounding and not, not completely standing out. Um, and so here's an aerial view. The water quality facilities are outlined there in yellow. And then the yellow dots are the poles and the blue marks are the stones. Stephanie, thank you so much. I'm going to show you this video. Get a better summary. Community in Butternut Creek experiences a lot of costs and benefits from being in an older watershed that was developed earlier. A lot of riparian. Oh. <clears throat> riparian vegetation was removed, so it's subject to more flooding. It's subject to conflicts with beavers and wildlife. So the three main parts of this project are handling the stormwater that runs off of the roads, the businesses, the homes, the school. The second part of it is to make the stream more resilient and able to handle changes in flows that happen every winter, every summer. And then the last one is to engage this community and have a good relationship with the neighbors. <laughs> Thank you.
In order to make the stream more resilient, we had to do a fair amount of analysis of the whole watershed. We looked at the levels of flooding that occurred in the wintertime, many of which are natural flooding. And then the last part of it is to do analysis of what kinds of wildlife habitat and vegetation needs would meet the community of plants and animals that you would typically find along a stream. We took water that would normally be destined for detention basin and in an upland area and held there for a time period so it doesn't increase the volume in the creek. We allowed that water to go directly into the creek and we put wood and other materials into the creek to slow down that water and allow the floodplain to act like a big sponge, which is what floodplains should do. Clearwater Services came to classrooms and talked to them about what the creek was, what it was doing, about the whole like water pollution, things that they can do to protect the environment in general. Clean Water Services and the school created this art project type of contest, either of what they hope to see in the creek or something they actually did observe. Uh, during this process, students created uh, some art pieces and we selected about 60 of these art pieces to be engraved on the beaver posts that are around the creek. The school and the community has many people that are Spanish speaking, so things are translated in Spanish as well. Just involving the school was such a key to the success of this. You, you got people's attention through the kids. People are are just going to want to know more about the project because of that connection. I'm very excited about this project so that they can learn more about nature and the creek and hopefully learn to respect it and go on to respect other natural resources that they come in contact with. Really hoping students will have this sense of ownership with the project and that in the long term, it will also help maintain what has been created here. When you bring a school into a project like this, what you're doing is you're inviting the entire family in through the kids. And I'm just hoping that more and more folks are gonna be more involved in projects like this in the future, which is only gonna be good for the projects themselves and the unity of the community. So I hope the kids here in this community and the community members you know, continue to connect with this creek. I connect with it and I really enjoy that a lot about that. Thanks for bearing with that. Um, I'm really glad you got to hear from Rob Emanuel, who is the project manager. Research shows nostalgia can help you remember ads. So customize and save with Liberty Mutual. The war in Ukraine forced my family. Okay. Um, the the last the last thing that I just want to mention is that uh, you know there was this in, intensive involvement with the school over the last two years. Um, we are not done because we have installed the pool, so there are opportunities to create an outdoor classroom, which we've talked about at the school, um, and then re-engage classes with students now that the pools are there. Right, just that they're there because that doesn't mean something inspired by walking down there. Um, so there are. There's definitely more engagement to, to be done there. Um, and then the project itself, there are enhancement components like the new We're not done, um, but um, really excited about this work. Questions, comments? Okay, we'll move on to How long do you think the models last? Yes, excellent question. We, we, um, we had lots of conversations with the um, the consulting team um, that we worked with to put those in. Actually, our field operations crews installed that, which was also another lovely addition here. Um, but they're supposed to, the, the wood itself is supposed to last 50 years. Um, we don't think that the engravings will last that long, but um, there's opportunity there maybe to re engrave or do something differently. Um, we also talked a lot about graffiti, like what, what, if, what if this gets spray painted? What if this happens? None, none of that has happened yet. Um, but, you know, then the process there is sanding down the wood. So uh, there, are, there are ways to. So you spoke a lot about the, the school and the education partnership. Yeah. 
you hear a lot about your neighbor? Yes. The coming of so there, there, that was a big part of the project. Not, not my, my specialty or focus, um, but I, I can speak to it just a little bit. Yes, absolutely. Um, so we had that open house with the neighborhood and so mailings and outreach of that nature. Also then um, consulting with community engagement liaisons. Paul, who was in the video, um, was at every, every event and meeting. And so then we also hired folks within the community to consult with us um, through the whole process of the art and the project itself. Um, and then also those um, to the, the opportunities for backyard habitat um, participation. And so we offset the cost for folks to participate. We also get free plants. So that's expanding that enhancement area from that creek, hopefully into neighborhoods and removing as many barriers as possible for folks to participate. And then I think the last key piece is the Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District working with um, an HOA that's adjacent there as well to do some. So that's kind of the minimal amount of that, that I can explain. Thank you. So then is it a one type Yeah, I, I describe this prop this project as like all the things, right? It's stormwater, it's enhancement, it's students, it's families, it's the community, Washington County. It's a lot going on. Thanks. Of course. Thank you. Okay, uh, we've come to our public comment invitation. Do we have members of the public who'd like to speak? Mind you, we have a two minute limit. Which Stephanie will time. I see that Dale Peak has his hand raised. Well, Mr. Peak, and I will activate your microphone. Mr. Peak, are you with us? Over. I can't hear a thing. Is anybody hearing me? We do hear oh, you. Yes. People are shaking their heads. I can't. Somebody, am I supposed to talk now? I don't know what's up. Yes. Yes, Dale. Yes. You can hear me, but I can't hear you. Oh, so that'll oh. be interesting. Okay. <laughs> Give me feedback. I just want to appreciate what Bob Baumgartner said about the regulatory agency and what's happening and thank you for all what the work in Clean Water Services is doing. Also, uh, the quality for fluorinated substances, the PFAS, P1, all that, as Bob said, you know, Intel and semiconductor industry uh, may be substituting different chemicals in that whole class of chemicals, but they don't know what they do either. So it's important to stay on top of, uh, of those substances. As the regulations get stricter and stricter about them, uh, I just want to make a second comment about local emergency planning committee meetings. Uh, the county has taken since 2015, but the county now has finally established a local emergency planning committee uh, on federal and state state and federal regulations, uh, have bylaws, and have members now. And Michelle. Beasley of Clean Water Services Safety uh, Officer for Clean Water Services has been participating in that. And so that's been very good. And so there will be uh, more information given to the public and to you about the local emergency planning committee and the impact that that could have on, on emergency planning. And for the people that live around the 40 or so industrial sites in the county that, that have hazardous corrosive materials that if they get out uh, could create a safety and health hazard and, and plan that uh, is uh, is being made to help people be aware of that and what to do so anyway, I'm, I'm pleased with the county's emergency management that's john wheeler and former director scott porter who's working part-time to get that project done so local emergency planning committee is active in Washington County now. And the chair is elected, and that's a final person from land research, the semiconductor supplier. I'm through. Thanks. Did you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. Can't hear you. So I'm going to take off because I can't hear you. Bye. <laughs> Thanks.
Uh, any other public comments? We have no members of the public left. Okay, great. Thanks, Stephanie. You're welcome. Okay, uh, with that, uh, Mark, we uh, just through announcements. Yes. Um, I, we spoke with our board of directors yesterday about the proposed the nominations that the commission brought forward to them for the uh, budget committee. And uh, so we will go ahead on March 7th and make those appointments. And that's uh, Elaine and, and Mark Farrar, who will have terms that end in uh, September of 2025. And Alex and Matt uh, ended up with the terms that will end in uh, September of 2024. So that will happen. The other thing is, I think Glenn Fee may have dropped off. Glenn is the executive director of 12 River Keepers. We have also proposed to the board, and they have agreed to appoint Glenn to fulfill the other environmental position um, that was formerly held by the previous executive director of the 12 River Keepers. So he will just step in and complete Jan Wilson's term, which runs through September of 2024. Two other items. One is every other year, although we have it the last couple of years because of the pandemic, we always do a barbecue and canoe trip on the Tuolumne River with our board of directors. Um, very fun. It's it's a great time. We have the date for that set. We'll send an invitation out to you. It's off cycle from our regular meeting. It'll be on Thursday, September fourteenth, from four thirty to seven thirty in the evening. So it's a, it's a fun time to be down on the water. Board really likes water guns, so if you be prepared to get wet, maybe we have a good time there. Um, and I guess the last thing I would be plugging Glenn, and when we do that, we'll be doing it in partnership with 12 River Keepers, which is why I wish Glenn was still on here. And then the last thing also to plug Glenn again, and also to acknowledge uh, your, your hat, 12 River Keepers annual meeting will be in this room on Saturday from 11 to 1. We are hosting that meeting for them. They kind of move around the county every year. We'll be there at the meeting, so we're thrilled to be able to do that. With that, the only other thing is our next meeting is on March 7th. You can anticipate getting the information on the 8th, I'm sorry, yes, 8th. I'm thinking the 7th is. Mm -hmm. I should tell, it's always great in February because you know the next meeting is the exact same, exact same day, right? Except for on leap year. So it's on the 8th, and we will be sending you that information on the National Natural Hazards Mitigation Plan as it relates to our facilities and operations. So that will be coming to you. We'll be asking you to look at that and provide input to us in advance in the next commission meeting. So that's all I have. Okay. Thanks. Uh, with that, we're adjourned. Thank you for hanging out with us. My bad time is. Yeah, <laughs> 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 <laughs>